Welcome everyone to the final session of the first SKIP online workshop today. In the final session, we will have uh, two speakers, Julia Sapelon and Leona Gottwald. So uh, Julia has uh, earned her master's degree in mathematics at uh, the University of Padua in Italy and moved then to Polytechnic Montreal where she worked on her PhD under the supervision of Andrea Lodi. She has just very recently successfully defended her uh, PhD and uh, will now tell us about a crucial part of her PhD work. The title of the talk is Parametrizing Branch and Bound Search Trees to Learn Branching Policies. Julia, please. Thank you. Thank you, Ambrose, for the introduction and also for the invitation to the workshop. So yes, today I will present a recent work, in fact, that is joined with a Jason Joe, Andrea Lodi and Joshua Ben Joe that are all based in Montreal, in which we use SKIP and machine learning uh, to learn branching policies, branching roles for branch and bound. So as all of you, oops, as all of you uh, probably know, branch and bound is the algorithmic backbone when we want to solve a mixed integer a linear problem, so a problem in which we uh, usually minimize a linear objective function under a set of linear constraints, and we require some variables to be integer. Branch and bound is an exact uh, tree search method in which we iteratively solve uh, relaxations of the problem at hand, and we partition the solution space in following a divide and conquer approach by branching on variables. And what does that mean? Uh, well, when we are at a given node in our search tree and we want to split it into sub-problems, uh, we look at the set of variables that are candidates for branching at that node. So the set of variables that are uh, required to be integer, but they were assuming a fractional uh, value uh, at the relaxed solution. We select a variable from the set of candidates following some, some rules, some branching criterion, um, and then we create two new nodes, two child nodes, according to a disjunction on the value of this variable in the relaxed solution. So branch and bound is just uh, one of the many building blocks that we find today in MILP solvers uh, like SKIP, uh, which are complex and flexible systems in which several components are in fact interacting uh, to solve uh, efficiently uh, the MILPs. And many crucial decisions in those algorithms that we deployed are heuristic. Variable selection is one of those decisions, and it's clearly a key factor for the success of the optimization as it decides how the tree is expanded and grown. So the lack of theoretical understanding behind this variable selection decision, but more generally behind uh, also other uh, decision makes branch and bound the perfect uh, ground for machine learning experiments, uh, which have lately been thriving in a variety of discrete optimization settings. So in particular, uh, we'll look at learning to branch, uh, that is to say, uh, in approaching the variable selection problem with machine learning techniques. And uh, learning to branch is nowadays an established theme in the literature, uh, with most works uh, focusing on imitating the strong branching policy, uh, which is a valid uh, but an expensive branching scheme. And most works are also interested in specializing the learned policies to special classes of combinatorial problems. So for example, in obtaining a branching policy that is good for TSPs or for set covering instances or facility location one and so on and so forth. So we're interested in learning to branch but in contrast with the other method, we seek a broader generalization scope for our policies. So in particular, we would like to learn a policy that will be a good branching policy, not only within a special class of problem, but across heterogeneous generic MILPs without any restriction on the structure and the size of the formulations. So in this sense, our hypothesis is that while uh, generic MILPs might not have in common a parametric structure, they might actually share a higher order structure in the space of branch and bound search trees. 
which can be used to represent the dynamism and complexity of branching. So behind this hypothesis, there are multiple intuition behind also our approach in general. The first one is that some algorithmic decision could depend on the state of the search. So there exists uh, algorithmic patterns in the branch and bond process. There are MILP resolution phases, uh, according to which some algorithmic decision could be tuned or adapted. And this pattern and phases uh, can be identified and described with a statistical use of the data from the search, uh, which is in fact abundant, and yet it's mostly unexploited currently uh, in the solvers. Second is the fact that, as we already said, uh, the search evolution and the variable selection problem are clearly deeply linked. And thus in a highly integrated framework, one ought to select a variable based on its broader role, uh, on its role, based on its role in the search components. And to some extent, uh, this is what already happens in state-of-the-art branching rules, which are essentially mechanisms uh, to score a variable based on their effectiveness uh, in the search. So take, for example, the default branching rule of skip, uh, rel PS cost, which is a reliability variant of uh, hybrid branching. So rel PS cost is combining multiple scores from different components uh, of the solver in a weighted sum in order to score a variable. And besides the importance of these different components, these different functionalities, uh, might change dynamically uh, during the exploration. So if you actually look at the skip formula for branching, you'll find that there's a dynamic factor, a coefficient, uh, that adjusts these weights in the formula and consequently the variable scores, depending on information about the nodes that are pruned uh, in the tree. So the solver that we know, Skip as well, um, they've been equipped with this type of branching rules. They've been successful across a variety of problems, across heterogeneous uh, MILPs. And so our hypothesis translates into the idea of considering the variable roles in the search and the tree exploration itself in order to perform a more flexible variable selection and to get a policy that can adapt to uh, the search exploration, the search evolution. So we want to explore the idea of learning branching policies from parameterization or descriptions of branch and bound search trees, which we believed are shared among general MILPs. And in order to do that, we'll need first to uh, represent the branching problem in this higher order space, which we believe exists underlying. Uh, and to do that, we'll need to define this parameterization via input features. And to combine then these input features, uh, to combine this data from the optimization uh, in a machine learning model. In our case, it will be a deep neural network architecture in order to get a branching policy. Okay, so let's start to see how we define uh, input features. At every branching step T, or better, I would say, at every node that needs to be branched uh, in the tree, we try first to represent the set of candidate variables at that node by an input matrix. So in this matrix, every candidate variable is represented by a vector of 25 scalars, uh, in which we try to capture precisely the multiple roles that the variable can have throughout the search. So we encode information about the LP bound and the solution of the variable, statistic on the solution, and also on the participation of the variable in the different search components and in past branchings. And of course, we also include in this representation uh, the scores of the hybrid branching formula in SKIP. We then have a separate additional um, representation, a different input, uh, 3T, which is a vector in which we try to encode the dynamic state of the branch and bound search. So in there, we record information not only about the local node we are at, so the depth and the bound uh, of it, but uh, more general information about the tree composition in terms of how many nodes are explored, how many are still open, uh, how many were pruned, how the global bounds are evolving, aggregated scores on the variable and statistics on the list of open nodes, so in the frontier, 
uh, and in particular how, for example, the bound estimates are distributed uh, in the list of open nodes. Okay, so we have these two uh, parameterization and we will use them as inputs uh, to deep neural network architectures. Uh, and in particular, we define two different architectures. The first one uh, only uses uh, the input from the candidate uh, variables. So to give you uh, in brief uh, an idea of how the modeling goes, every uh, representation of a candidate variable of length 25 it's first embedded in a layer of the deep neural network uh, in a larger representation. And then this, the dimensionality of this representation is subsequently reduced until finally every candidate variable is represented by a single scalar. And it's across uh, these scalars that we apply a softmax function in order to get a probability distribution over the candidate set according to which we will select our uh, variable uh, for branching. So that's the first model, uh, which uses only the candidate input uh, variable. Um, and we call it the no tree model because it doesn't use uh, the explicit information from the tree. Uh, the second model instead does. So in the second model, our input tree T first enter uh, some layer uh, to output a vector g whose components are uh, between zero and one. And we use chunks of this g vector to modulate uh, the intermediate uh, parameterization of the candidate variable that were up in the other network. Okay, so this modulation uh, operation, uh, also called feature gating practically, um, represent the high level idea that a signal from the tree can be used to provide a richer context uh, to the variable selection uh, problem and that a branching policy should adapt uh, based on the, on the tree evolution itself. Okay, so a couple of remarks uh, before going to see some uh, the experimental setting. So both states, both input uh, vector that we, matrix and vector that we collect, CT and 3T at every branch node are gathered via a customized version of Pyskip opt and they do not explicitly depend on the parameters of the instances nor on its structure. Also note that the cardinality of the uh, candidate set varies widely, not only across different MILPs, but in fact within uh, the, for the same MILP throughout the branch and bound search. So here you see a, an histogram of how this cardinality of the candidate set is distributed um, in our data. So it varies a lot and because it varies, also does the uh, dimensionality of our input. And to accommodate this in our network, we treat this dimension as a batch dimension uh, so we don't really have any limit on the structure, the size of the MILP instances, but also on the size of the uh, candidate uh, set of variables. Also note that the 3T state which we encode is in fact dynamic and not static. So here are two TSNI plots that uh, we use to um, visualize how this 3T state evolves uh, throughout the search for two different MILP instances. And as you can see, the features definitely are uh, capturing some branch and bound dynamic, though this dynamic uh, can look uh, quite dissimilar for two different instances. Okay, so in order to test our features, input features and our architecture, we set up a new uh, imitation learning uh, framework. So first we need to curate a data set of MILP, so we select 27 heterogeneous instances from uh, various benchmark libraries. And to better explore the generalization abilities of our policies, we focus on uh, manageable tree sizes. Um, then there's a phase of data collection, which is offline. So we run our instances uh, with skip, and at every uh, branch node, we collect our inputs, so our matrix CT and 3T. Um, together with some expert labels. So in this case, we want to imitate uh, skip default branching rules. So at every step, we also 
collect and uh, gather this uh, real PS cost uh, decision that we want to imitate. So we also put in place some data augmentation schemes. So of course our instances are run on different seeds and also we produce some initial randomization uh, in the tree uh, so that we can diversify better the input uh, spaces for our, for our policies. So what we observe is a data that is highly heterogeneous and for sure this heterogeneity which we wanted to work with uh, is challenging uh, on a practical level uh, but it's also very important to assess not only the framework that we put in place so the features and the architecture but also the hypothesis uh, that was behind it okay so as far as the solver setting goes we work with skip six in a sandbox setting which is precisely designed to fairly compare uh, branching rules. Uh, in this setting in particular, we have to disable our primal heuristics and to provide an optimal cutoff. Um, there's also a phase, of course, of training and validation of our deep neural network models. And then finally, the policies uh, that we obtain are tested and the test happens on never seen MILP instances. So on totally new uh, branching sets, uh, totally new inputs, uh, and also on larger, in fact, uh, branching sets. So we, we test our policies both in terms of their uh, imitation accuracy, so how good they are, how accurate they are at the imitation task, um, but also in terms of optimization, so optimization performance. To do that, we plug them in a skip as custom branching rules. Uh, and we do runs of multiple runs of our of on our instances. So in these runs, we will be uh, interested in checking how many nodes are explored uh, in the tree, and also in computing for skip default rule the fair number of nodes, which is a node count uh, that takes into account uh, the side side effects from strong branching, and it's a number that can be meaningfully computed in the sandbox setting that we work in. Okay, to compare our policies, um, we benchmark against GCNN, which is the uh, state of the art in learning to branch literature. So it's a method uh, that specifically exploits the uh, constraint structure of a matrix to imitate strong branching uh, and to specialize it to different classes of, of problem. And on the skip side, uh, we run uh, random pseudo cost and the default, the expert we imitate, real PS cost. Okay, so the results are clearly showing that incorporating an explicit parameterization of the tree state uh, clearly help, uh, helps the policies to generalize, both in terms of accuracy and in terms of uh, reduced tree size. So as we can see, the tree gate uh, architecture, so the one uh, which uses uh, the tree explicitly is better than the other one in all aggregated metrics. So here in the, the first table, it's a test uh, accuracy, we measure the test accuracy, so the imitation learning accuracy. And the tree gate policies reaches a 19% better test accuracy uh, than the no tree one. Well, the GCNN method uh, really struggles uh, to fit this data that is coming from such heterogeneous instances and for which, uh, which it, it didn't see during, during the training phase. So it reaches only an accuracy of 15%. In terms of uh, branch and bound uh, runs, branch and bound nodes, again, the tree gate architectures, uh, when restricted to, for example, the test instances, produces trees that are on average uh, with 27% less nodes than our other model that only uses the representation of the candidate variables. Um, in terms of solving instances, both our policies are able to solve all the instances like skip uh, default and do not hit time limit, which is a thing that instead the GCNN method does, so it fails to solve most um, test instances. Um, and then overall, I would say uh, compared to the other uh, skip branching rule. Both our policies are better than random and pseudo cost and they're instance by instance relatively comparable to skip but when of course only when uh, the strong branching side effects are taken into account so in terms of fair uh, number of nodes. 
So that provides a, an overview, I would say, of the results. And um, to wrap up, I would say that we wanted to explore this idea of uh, learning branching policies from description, from parameterization of branch and bound search trees uh, that are shared among heterogeneous MILPs. So we wanted to represent branching in this higher order space, and we did that by coming up with two uh, features description, one for the candidate set of variables at every branching step, and, and another one, another input is for the state of the branch and bound search in general. And we combine these two inputs uh, via some deep neural network architecture, and in particular, we build one uh, in which we use a tree signal, a signal coming from the explicit parameterization of the tree to modulate, to provide a context uh, over uh, the branching selection problem. Results have shown that uh, parameterizing uh, these uh, search trees really helps to learn branching policies that are able to attain this broader generalization goal, so to span across heterogeneous uh, MILPs. And we allow, it allows to approach these heterogeneous MILPs without the need of some training analog. So without the need of having seen in the training phase for the policies, some similar instances. So this idea of uh, incorporating a tree related context uh, for branching will definitely be useful, we think, for future learning to branch approaches, in particular, uh, those that will be developed with reinforcement learning instead of imitation learning, for example, in the task of reward design or state, uh, other state uh, design. But more generally, we also believe that uh, this idea could be leveraged more in MILP algorithmic design. And I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Julia, this was a wonderful talk um, and you have some really interesting results. So uh, I ask everyone to post their questions into the chat uh, and uh, maybe I'll try to kick off the questions uh, by some questions of my own. So um, maybe directly related to one of the graphics that you had, um, you mm -hmm. had these uh, plots where you uh, plotted the development of the trees for two yes. different instances. Could you maybe yes. just quickly explain what we actually can see there? Yeah, not much because so Disney <laughs> plot, yes, Disney plot is a tool uh, that is mostly used for visualization, but it's very tricky to get some idea of what it represents. So maybe you will need to have like multiple plots of the same data to get a sense of it. Uh, so what we observe in general, I mean, we didn't plot only for these two instances, of course, uh, is that there's o there always is this uh, idea of like moving, of, of a search, uh, of, of a search that is evolving. Um, mm -hmm. Some so things this is are, what the colors mean, the color basically. Yeah, exactly. Time. Oh, yes. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. That's like, so it goes from blue, which is the zero, which is basically the root node, to some, the number of explore node for that run. And so it's the, the tree state, how it evolves from the root node, how it's measured from the root node on in the other mm -hmm. nodes. So in ex, uh, for example, in the EIL 33-2 instance, uh, that's like a very clear sort of evolution, very like a, con a continuous motion uh, for yes. it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and you see there's like the, the other, there probably are like two blue dots at the beginning that are not in the continuous point. And that's because, for example, some of our features at the root node are not properly defined, say those in which we look at the leaves and so on. And so part maybe of the state is at zero or like it's not meaningful yet. And then mm -hmm. as soon as you really start the tree exploration, then the, the vector starts speaking more. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Uh, then I guess we can come to some questions from the audience. Yes. Um, so uh, Christopher Brown asks, what motivated the decision to use Skip's rel PS cost as an oracle rather than uh, strong branching mm -hmm. as other experiments have done? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so first there was the fact that uh, we didn't think the strong branching was a 
re realistic uh, expert to imitate. So, so no solver really uses a default uh, strong branching. Uh, but more than that, it was the idea that we are really focusing on the tree evolution. We are really, we really also in our representation of the candidate variables, we are trying to uh, develop scores that are describing the variables in the different components and the skip default branching rule is doing precisely that. So those scores are there and are like describing the candidate variables according to different components of the solver. So it appears to us as like the, uh, the intuitive expert that we wanted to imitate in our context. Yes, I, I absolutely agree. Um, I mean, it's just additional information as well that uh, is very cheap and just available. It should be used. So this was actually asked by two people, also by Christine Brown at the same time. Uh, then Philip Christoffel um, has a question. Why did you only compare nodes and not time? Does the evaluation take a lot of time? Yeah, uh, so I didn't report time here because the benchmark with the GCNN is fairly recent and was run on another machine. So we want to redo all the skip evaluation on a same machine to compare time uh, effectively. So in terms of time, it's not really, uh, the policies are not bad. So the GCNN of course is, is time limiting. So yeah, it's, it's not very good, but our policies, uh, they, do not take, they don't, do not seem to take uh, much longer uh, than the default skip. They're not faster though. So there's, I mean, uh, in the reliability pseudo cost, you, you, you have some overhead from the strong branching evaluation. We don't have that overhead, but it's somehow a thinner overhead, which is spread uh, across all the nodes to evaluate the deep neural network. But the deep neural network is actually light, also memory wise, so it doesn't really require uh, a lot of effort. Like the GCNN is instead very heavy in memory terms as well. So it's, it's a bit of a problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, Gautam Seshadri asks, do you have a sense for the sensitivity of the results, both accuracy relative to LPS cost and time to solve? Um, so sensitivity of the results to the number of training MILP instances used. Oh, uh, not really. So in, uh, before arriving at these results, I mean, when we were curating the data set, we definitely experimented with like uh, less instances and so on. Uh, but I think one experiment that we could do uh, would be maybe to still keep our, the number of instances we have and maybe swap them for training and test and, and see what will happen. So also note that we do have only 27 MILP instances, but of course the number, number of data points that we use for uh, training our policies is much bigger. So yeah, also in, so in the test set, for example, I think we have around 30,000 data points to test mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, a question from Victor Miller. Have you thought of applying this to the branching decisions of set solvers? No, but, <laughs> uh, but if you tell me how we could do it, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we can think about it. No, we didn't. But I, think, I think the difference is that set solvers don't, um, don't complete, explore a tree so completely as, um, uh, as MIP solvers as do. Mm. Or, I mean, they do partially and then restart yes. a lot, right? So I think it's a different game. But, uh, but, yeah. but yeah, it could still be interesting. I mean, I think uh, even for partial trees, some information can be gathered. Uh, of course, that will be a trade-off because if you explore maybe uh, too less, uh, then this information might, from the tree might not be uh, so important, right? If the instance is solved in like some 20 nodes, then maybe, yeah, this exploration, this tree evolution will not be really meaningful, um, but still maybe, yeah, one could do something. Mm -hmm. So um, I have one more question. So there are actually many questions, but we are not able to answer all of them, I guess, in the session. So we will have to postpone some to the mm -hmm. Slack workspace. Yes. But here's one that's also a bit related. So I like very much your motivation in the beginning where you said like branching is such a good uh, test bed for machine learning and optimization yes. because we don't understand it. 
Yes. Um, <laughs> So you, uh, so have you gained some additional? I mean, that you can. Uh, this, this can be understood in two ways, right? Either there is nothing mm -hmm. to understand, or we simply have not understood it yet. So have you gained additional um, understanding? And related was a question from the audience. So uh, who was interested whether branching technique remains the same for both binary integer or general MIL problems, which maybe also yeah way. yes so the to answer first the second question yes the branching techniques is the same we have some we have a few general integers uh, variable in our instances not all of them i think mostly they are mixed binary uh, but there are a couple of general integers as well um so for your question about if we gain something i think the clear message that we got uh, and that actually it's what we wanted to explore was that using this tree information could be helpful and we really believe it could be helpful not only for branching so I actually believe before being applied to branching this could be applied like this idea could be applied somewhere else um, in the silver um, as, as far as branching goes um, I think one would need to work in a more interpretable setting so for example remove all the non-linearities of the deep neural networks Mm -hmm. uh, keep maybe the dimensionality fixed and really have a look at like what the network is selecting as a good feature or a bad feature and so on and so forth. So you will uh, trade off the performance of the network for interpretability uh, and then understand uh, better what's mm -hmm. going on. Yes. But that would be a future step. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> All right, then uh, thank you again very much, Julia, for thank this you. wonderful talk. Thank uh, thanks to the audience for all the good questions, and I'm sorry that we could not address all of them here. Please uh, just uh, post them as well to Julia in the Slack workspace. Yes, I'll join. <laughs> all thank right. you. So, thanks again.